Good afternoon, guys. Uh, my name is Mohammed Galar, and I'm going to talk about doing uh, machine data analytics with Cassandra. Uh, and I'm going to actually interchangeably use the term machine data and internet of complex things. So don't get confused. You're at the right talk. So a couple of things before I get started. Uh, as I'm going through the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to ask right away. You don't have to wait till the end. Uh, the other thing is sometimes I talk very fast, and once you combine that with my heavy Indian accent, it could be hard to understand me. So if that's happening, just raise your hand, ask me to slow down, OK? So uh, let me first introduce myself. Uh, I'm an application architect and a lead developer at Glassbeam. I'm lucky to have that role because I'm passionate about both things, actually. I enjoy designing new things and then building them up. So uh, it's fun to, do, to be able to get to do both. Uh, and before I joined Glassframe, I was working on my own startup uh, with the two products. The first one was an idea discussion platform called Good or Great Idea that allowed people to discuss ideas, new ideas, new product ideas, new business ideas, and rate them and have qualitative discussion around those ideas. The other product that we built was uh, Trustrix, which was a social recommendation engine, solving the same problem that Yelp is solving, but leveraging your social network. OK, so I think one thing that's helpful is uh, for me to know the audience. So I'm going to do a pop quiz, uh, but the answers are easy, so don't be afraid. Uh, so how many of you in this room are very comfortable with Cassandra and have worked with Cassandra for some time? OK, so it looks like maybe around 20 30%. How many of you have just started learning Cassandra? OK, so the majority of the people are in that other segment. OK. Uh, what about IoT? Uh, it's a pretty hard word. A lot of people talk about it. How many of you are actually working on IoT? Okay, so roughly 20%. And how many of you have read about it? Okay, what about the rest of the folks? <laughs> so it looks like either some people are lazy or probably have not been uh, reading much about IoT. Um, so it's, it's a really hard uh, word. A lot of companies are talking about it. You hear it about it in the news, and we'll go through some of that uh, during my presentation. OK. The other thing is, uh, in terms of your background, uh, how many of you are on the technical side? And by technical, I mean development, operations. OK, so it looks like a big chunk of the audience. Uh, and how many of you are on the business side, product management, marketing? A few. OK, so it looks like most of the crowd is technical. That's great. So before I uh, get into the meat of my presentation, I want to set the stage by defining the problem. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with IoT, uh, you know that it's, it's, in, it's in the news a lot these days. And the data from IoT is exploding. Uh, there are devices that are generating huge amount of data, according to a study uh, by done by Cisco uh, and IDC and uh, Wikibon. It's estimated by the year 2020, there will be 20 times uh, connected devices. Uh, so I guess all of us will be, uh, for each individual, there will be 20. So basically, that means we'll have smartphones, smart glasses, smart shoes. Everything is going to be smart. That's what essentially it means. Uh, the same study also points that 42% of the data is going to be generated by machines. Uh, and if you, to just put that into perspective, the uh, right-hand side of the slide shows you how the data, the size of data that has been generated over a period of time. So until the 1980s, most of the data was getting generated by apps, which was structured data, not a huge volume. It would take years before the company got to a stage where they had terabytes of data. And then the internet took off uh, in the 1990s, and suddenly you had people sending emails, sharing pictures, posting videos, and that data eclipsed the, all the data that was generated previously. Uh, but the next big wave is the data that's going to come out of IoT. Uh, that's going to be even huge, a lot more than what people have been generating so far. And, and this data presents new challenges. Uh, the three main ones, and some of you may have heard about this, uh, from other places too. Uh, so volume, variety, and velocity. Uh, volume is in terms of the amount of data. There are instrumented devices that can generate terabytes of data on a daily basis. Uh, by variety, I mean that earlier, again, going back to the older days, apps was generating structured data. Now you have this machine data, which is not just structured, but it can also be unstructured or multi-structured. Multi 
And later on in my uh, presentation, I'll describe what I mean by multi-structure. Uh, and then the third uh, key attribute of IoT is velocity. So when humans are generating data, it's at human speed. When, when the machines are generating data or the internet of things, it's at machine speed. So it's coming at much faster pace, which means this kind of technology you need for consuming that data needs to be totally different. But, but IoT also presents new opportunities. So it's not just that you have new challenges, there's also new opportunities. Uh, and uh, organization, multiple groups across uh, in an organization can benefit from that data. So I've listed some of the key groups that benefit from that data. First one is support. support. Uh, by leveraging the machine data, support organization can be more proactive instead of being reactive. So instead of waiting for the customer to call and say, hey, my system is not working, now actually support can analyze the data that they're getting from the machines that are out in the field and see if something is not working, then proactively take steps to fix those. Imagine how happy a customer would be if he gets a call from support and, say, and the support guy says, Mr. Customer, I see that one of the component in your system is having some problem and that's going to crash the system in a few days, so we are sending you a replacement parts. Imagine what the reaction would be when the customer hears that. Uh, the second benefit that support gets from a the machine data is that they can actually lower the mean time to resolution. So those of you who have tried to solve problems remotely, you know that you need a lot of information when you're trying to fix something. And with machine data, all that information is there, which means support can actually be a lot more quicker in resolving whatever issues the customer is facing. And as a result of that, right, being proactive and being able to resolve issues much faster, you make the customer happy, the customer satisfaction goes up, and also your support cost goes down, right? Because instead of taking uh, 30 minutes, if you can do the same thing in 10 minutes, the, your cost has gone down significantly, the productivity has gone up. The second group that benefits from uh, machine data is marketing. Uh, they can actually see how the product is getting used in the field. What's the adoption curve? Uh, so I'll give you an example. Let's say you have uh, released a product that has 20 features. How do you know which features are getting used, which are not getting used? So if you're, if you're getting uh, data from the machine itself, then it's pretty easy to analyze that and see what's going on. Uh, similarly, let's say you've released multiple products over a period of time. How do you know which products have been deployed out in the field? A lot of times customers will buy something but not really deploy it. So if you have access to the machine data, then you can see over a period of time what is the adoption curve for different models. Similarly, engineering gets uh, insights from how the product is getting used and they can build better products for their customer. And then the last group to benefit is sales. They can discover upsell and cross sale opportunities by analyzing the machine data. Uh, a good example would be, let's say you're a storage vendor, you're selling storage to your customers. If you could see in that machine data that some of my customers are already at 80% capacity, you know that this customer is going to need more storage, right? So you can proactively call that customer and give him what he needs. So there's one more thing I need to define actually before we continue, Internet of Complex Things. So far we have talked about IoT. Uh, so Internet of Complex Things is a subset of IoT. Uh, and this includes basically systems that provide complex functionality. So I've shown some examples here uh, on the slide. And this would include, for example, in a data center, this would include your uh, legacy servers, storage systems, routers, switches, security devices. In a hospital setting, this would be the equipments that a surgeon uses for surgery, for example. In a lab environment, it could be whatever the lab technician is using. These are all getting internet connected now. Similarly, there are industrial devices that companies like G and uh, Honeywell are making that are all connected and sending tons of data back to the man uh, product manufacturer. In the automobile section, you have these new cars. For example, the cars that Tesla makes, they are heavily instrumented. Uh, they are not turned on by default for a privacy reason. Uh, but they can actually track everything that the car is doing at any given point of time if they wanted to. And then of course you have smartphone and other connected uh, devices. So, so what does Glassbeam do? Uh, so we are basically, um, we offer a SaaS based product that allows our customers to do analysis of their structured or unstructured machine data. So as an input we take whatever operational data that the devices are generating in the field the customer sends it to us, and on the other side, basically we provide a bunch of apps that allows them to do whatever analytics they want to do on that data. So, 
So uh, as I mentioned, I'll, I'm going to describe what multi-structured data looks like. Uh, now this, this data could come in one file or it could be actually in multiple files. Uh, if you pay attention or if you look closely at uh, what's shown here, not on, like the data actually that's shown there has multiple sections and each section has a different layout. And there's another thing actually that's very different in each section and that's the frequency at which that data changes. So if you look at the first section uh, which I've marked as static, it has key value pair. And that data very rarely changes actually across the lifetime of a product. Uh, in some cases it might be every year, in some cases it might never actually. If you look at the next section, the uh, config section, it has tabular layout and that information is going to change more frequently. The third one is the statistical information. Uh, again, it has totally different layout than the config section and that one actually is going to change a lot more frequently. In some cases it might be 10 times a day, in some cases it might be every minute, in some cases every second. And then the last one is the logs. Uh, so how do you capture this kind of information, right? That's the first thing, okay. The data has different layout, different frequency which changes. How do you extract meaning out of this kind of data? To do this, we created our own uh, language, which we called uh, SPL. That's our core IP. So this, even though the name actually says semiotic parsing language, it doesn't allow us just to do parsing, but a lot of other functionality. So it allows us to specify the parsing rules, how exactly to parse multi-structured or unstructured data, where to store it, how to store it, what kind of search capabilities that we want to provide on this data, what kind of analytics transformation. So this is how, this is what enables us to provide that analytics capability on the uh, multi-structured data that we get from our customer. So this is a 60,000 foot view of our solution. Um, customers are sending, our, uh, sending us uh, unstructured machine data. We have SPL defined for each customer. And using that SPL, we are able to extract meaning out of that data and then we have on the other side that our customers use. And this is what the first generation architecture looked like of our product. So the input is same as you saw on the previous slide. Um, and then we have a parser that basically applies the SPL rules to the incoming data, extracts that data, puts it into an SQLite database. Once that part is done, an ETL process kicks off, takes that data and puts it into a data warehousing platform, which in this case is Vertica. And then we have another pro ETL program that kicks off up at that point, takes that data from a subset of that subset of the data from Vertica and puts it into uh, MariaDB. And then we have an Apache-based uh, web app that the users can use. So this worked actually, uh, it was not a bad architecture, it worked for quite some time, but over a period of time we realized we were running into some challenges. For each product, so the question was, do you have to define different uh, SPL for each vendor? Yes. So, yes, the SPL is for each product, yes. So the first challenge that we ran into was that ingestion speed was slow because uh, we were using a traditional RDBMS which is read optimized. So the writes were not as fast as we would have liked. Uh, so ingestion speed was a pro becoming problem. Second problem was it was difficult to make schema changes and it was happening uh, quite often. So sometimes we'd parse the data and then later on the customer would say, oh, there's some important stuff that you guys missed. Can we start parsing this one too? Uh, so we had to reparse the data and uh, and when we do that, we also have to make schema changes. Now schema changes, okay, if you have small amount of data, but when, once you have a few terabytes of data, it's not that easy. Uh, so it was hard. Uh, and then reloading the data was painful too. So let's say we have been parsing data for six months, and then the customer comes and says, oh, we need you guys to parse some additional file that we were not sending earlier. And so we have to go back and reparse everything, reload that data, and that would take weeks and weeks, which was not acceptable. And the other thing was it was costly to scale this infrastructure. So what I've shown on the previous slide, we were pretty much, this is not a multi-tenant solution. For each customer, we were building this thing actually. So every customer had an instance of what, what's shown here. So that meant every time we got a new customer, we had to deploy a new infrastructure with the same set of tools. And it was painful to deploy it again and again and managing multiple things. It was an operational headache. 
So we decided to rewrite everything. Let's uh, let's say, okay, let's redesign everything. And this is what the next generation architecture looks like. Uh, there's a lot of information, so let me take a few minutes to go over each item. Uh, so the input is still the same. Uh, we get uh, streaming data, files in unstructured format or multi-structure format, and then we have SPL. Uh, the first change was that we rewrote the program that did the parsing. Uh, it's written in Scala now, and it's an order of magnitude faster than the previous parser that we had. But that what that also meant is that now we needed a data store that could keep up with the parser, actually. So we had to replace the data store layer. Uh, we have uh, Cassandra, we have S3, we have Solar Cloud, and Postgres. So typically what happens is as we are getting data, once it gets passed, the passed data goes to both into Cassandra as well as Solar Cloud. It gets in both locations. And the raw data in its original format gets, stores, gets stored on S3. And a subset of the data that goes into Cassandra also gets extracted into Postgres. And uh, as I go through the apps, I'll explain why we do that. And the uh, data layer is front-ended by a middleware. So th the uh, customers never get access directly to the database. Uh, everything is, or, or even our own apps, they never access the database directly. They are all going through this middleware layer, which we call info server. And it provides a, a set of REST APIs, so all the data is accessed through those APIs. So let me quickly go over the apps. So the first app uh, is the log vault. That's what allows customers to get access to their raw data. So if they want to go back and look at the data that they've been sending to us and be able to filter by date or time or whatever else, right? they can do that. And that's all being backed by S3. The Explorer app provides search engine functionality. So if a customer wants to do full text search on some data, they use our Explorer app. And that's where Solar Cloud comes into picture. So we are using the Solar and uh, Lucene engine in the back end to do, to do that. Workbench is our uh, BI tool. It allows customers to do ad hoc analytics, and that's the reason why some of the data gets extracted into Postgres, and I'll kind of go into more detail why we do that later on. Standard apps are the out-of-the-box analytics that we provide to our customers, so they don't have to create anything. These are app standard apps that already have all the analytical capabilities built in, the charting and the graphing, everything is there. All they have to do is just click to see a specific report or a specific dashbo uh, dashboard that they want to see. Uh, the rules and alert engine is an interesting one, actually, that allows uh, our users to create complex rules. Uh, so to give you an example, let's say if you are a storage vendor again, and if you want to know when a certain customer has reached 80% capacity utilization, you can create a rule saying, okay, if a customer has get, get such 80% generate an alert to me. So you don't have to be constantly monitoring the system, actually. The system is kind of monitoring it for you. And as data is coming in, it's parsing, it will look to see which conditions are being uh, met. And as soon as it meets a condition that's uh, listed in a rule, then it will generate the defined alert for you. Uh, it, it is our language, and it's SQL-like right now. So it's pretty similar to SQL. And then the last one that I've listed here is the direct access. So that's basically a set of REST API that we allow our customers to access directly. And the reason for doing that is there are customers who say, okay, I like the apps that you guys have built, but I have some uh, other apps that I want to build where I'm going to integrate some data that is coming from the other parts of the organizations, and I don't want to send you that data. Or they may already have an app that's providing some functionality, and they want to embed some of the past data that we have inside their application. So we expose that through the uh, uh, direct access layer, which is basically a set of REST APIs. So one of the questions I get asked is, why do you guys choose Cassandra? There are so many options. Uh, probably, uh, I mean, last I heard was there were like 150 uh, no SQL databases, but I met a friend today, and he said, actually, there are like a lot more than that. Uh, so why Cassandra, why, why not something else? And this goes back to the challenges that I mentioned earlier with IoT data, right? There are three key attributes for IoT data, volume, variety, and velocity. And Cassandra let us handle all those three challenges very uh, elegantly. So first, the first capability they liked in Cassandra was the linear scalability. It allows you to easily scale from gigabytes to terabytes, so you don't have to build an infrastructure upfront for handling terabytes of data. You can start with a very small cluster, and as you start getting more and more data, you can uh, add more clusters, and you can easily scale. 
So that allows you to uh, address the uh, volume uh, challenge. And the other one was variety. Uh, as I showed you, right, the uh, multi-structure document, it had different uh, characteristics, uh, different layouts, different change frequency. Now, Cassandra supports dynamic schema, which makes it really easy to consume that kind of data. So uh, we, uh, compared to what we were doing earlier in the RDBMS, life became a lot more easier. It's much easier to model that multi-structure data in Cassandra. And then the last one is velocity. Again, uh, Cassandra is write optimized, so your writes are extremely, extremely fast, and that's what we needed. So these were the three main reasons why we chose Cassandra, but then it actually provided one more benefit that helps us on the operational side, and that was that it allowed us to build a multi-tenant architecture. So earlier where we had separate infrastructure for each customer, now we have actually one infrastructure for all the customers. So there's one Cassandra cluster, there's one key space, and one set of column families for all the customers. And I don't think it would have been possible to build something like this using any other technology. So what do we store in Cassandra? Uh, so it's our main data store. Uh, all the data that comes in, once it's passed and we extracted meaning out of it, it goes into Cassandra, different column families within Cassandra. We also store the metadata, which makes if, uh, if somebody else wants to see what's in the data, so they can get a lot of information out of that metadata uh, column family that we have. Our apps, they're pretty flexible. Uh, so like even, for example, what kind of uh, color scheme to use, uh, whether a certain data should be shown in form of uh, chart or bar chart or pie chart or some kind of graph. All that's driven through a configuration, and that configuration is stored in Cassandra as well. So it makes it really easy to change the layout of the apps. We also keep uh, statistics about the usage of the app. So let's say an, a customer bought license for 100 users. And by looking at the stats, we know exactly whether 100 people are using or only 50. And if only 50 people are using, that means there's some problem, actually. So then you f try to figure out what can you do to make sure that everybody's using it, right? You can also see how exactly your apps are getting used, where people are spending time, what the flow is. And that way, you can optimize things and make user experience a lot better. Uh, and then the last thing we store in Cassandra is journal. So all the data that comes in as we are processing, we keep a journal, and that way it's easy to go back and audit and see what happened as the data came to us. So a few uh, word of wisdom here. Uh, it might not be anything new for those of you who have been working in Cassandra, but uh, for people who are just beginning to uh, uh, learn Cassandra, just started to uh, learn Cassandra, I thought this might be useful. The first thing is data model is important. Uh, so you need to be really, really careful how you're going to model your data. The, of course, the RDBMS model is not going to work. So you need to understand how Cassandra stores data and what kind of your queries you're going to run. So every, everything is driven by your queries, basically. Since there are no joins, you can't really do joins in Cassandra. Um, sometimes you do have to do it. You'll have to do it in the application, and it's painful to do that. So sort of spend time on understanding what are the query patterns and use that to create all the column families, design your data model. The other thing is avoid queries that are returning large amount of data. Uh, one reason not to do that is that it's slow, actually. Uh, Cassandra is really fast, extremely fast, if you're doing point reads. But if you try to read, let's say, millions of rows, it's not a good use case. Uh, the other thing is also if you're, when you're reading large amount of data, it can cause a lot of problems, garbage collection and things like that. And if you don't have enough memory, you can also uh, get uh, out of memory errors. OK, so wh what are the other lessons that we learned as we went through that experience? Um, one thing was that ad hoc queries are difficult. And this is kind of by design, I guess. Uh, in Cassandra, everything uh, is driven by query patterns. So you know your queries, you design the column families. And by definition, in case of ad hoc queries, you don't know what the queries are. A user may want to diff run different kinds of queries. So we found that it was very difficult to support those kind of use cases with Cassandra. And that's the reason why we are extracting a subset of the data that goes into Cassandra in Postgres. And that way, people can do some kind of ad hoc analytics on that data. Uh, the other thing was. Uh, You'll see here see a lot of BI tool vendors like Tableau, Pentaho, and everybody else. They have announced support for Cassandra. So if you go on their website, you'll say, yeah, Cassandra is supported. But the 
amount of the capability that they provide is nowhere close to the capabilities that they provide for traditional RDBMS. And then the last thing is about performance. So, I mean, some of the performance related stuff is pretty obvious, right? Your performance depends on your cluster size. Uh, obviously, if you say I'm going to store two terabytes of data on just two nodes, probably that's not a good thing. So you need to distribute the data. So it depends on your cluster size, the node per characteristics, right? How much memory you have, what kind of uh, uh, disk you have on that, uh, and the, the amount of memory, the what kind of memory you have. So those are some of the basic stuff that are hardware related, but there are a few additional things, and that's related to your data model and data. So whatever numbers you see being printed by, published by somebody may not apply to you. So the, the, the performance also depends how exactly your column family looks, what, how many clustering keys you have, and what kind of data you're storing in those keys. So that can impact performance by a huge degree, actually. So as you start deploying this, right, or building it, make sure you test it with your own column families, with your own schema, put some data that's reflective of the kind of data that you'll be storing there, and then do your own benchmark. That way you can size your cluster more accurately.